Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Tonight, we're so pleased to welcome Christy Harris into our At Home with Literati series in support of the Wellness Strap and in conversation with Eliza Wheeler. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase the book from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. Um, you can interact with us at any time, however, using the Q&A that's available to you on your toolbar. Please feel free to submit questions whenever you have them, and I'll read a selection of your questions at the conclusion of the conversation. And live transcription is available on your toolbar as well. If you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase books in the description directly below me. And you can also subscribe to our channel by clicking the typewriter icon in the bottom right corner of your screen to subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events, which will continue through 2023 there when they become live. And as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we would just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. Without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator, Christy Harrison, MPHRD, is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, certified intuitive eating counselor, and journalist who has been covering food, nutrition, and health for more than 20 years. She's the author of two books, The Wellness Trap and Anti-Diet, and the producer and host of the podcast, Rethinking Wellness and Food Psych, which have helped tens of thousands of people around the world think critically about diet and wellness culture and develop more peaceful relationships with food. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Self, BuzzFeed, Gourmet, Slate, The Food Network, and many other publications. And her work is regularly featured in national print and broadcast media. Speaking with her this evening, Liza Wheeler is an illustrator and author of books for children. Her first picture book, Miss Maple Seeds, was a New York Times bestseller. And her book, Home in the Woods, was dubbed gorgeous by the New York Times Book Review. She was a recipient of the Sendak Fellowship in 2017. She lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Please join me in welcoming Christy Harrison and Eliza Wheeler into your living rooms. Thank you, John. Yay, thanks so much. Awesome. Uh, it's so great to be here. Um, yeah. Christy, um, oh, well, I'll kind of introduce myself and why I'm here to cut, you know, you invited me to moderate this discussion, which was really exciting for me. Um, I, um, as you heard, I'm a children's book author and illustrator, so I'm not in the health industries, um, but I have a history with chronic illness um, and, you know, living in diet culture for the past 20 years. And um, so got stuck in the, the wellness trap and all of that. Um, from a pretty young age. And so I think I'm I'm here as the stand-in for the audience because I really am, you know, a sort of a proxy for your audience in this book. So it's it's gonna be exciting to talk about it and um, kind of get into the questions of of what led you to writing this book, but I'll, I'll let you say hello before I ask, start asking you questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that and, and for being here, Eliza. And thanks, John, for having us and, and to Literati for hosting. Um, thanks to everyone who's attending. I'm really excited to get to chat with you a little bit about the book and answer some of your questions about wellness culture and diet culture and you know anything you wanna ask based on our conversation. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm super psyched to talk to you, Eliza, specifically because I think your experience is so um, relevant to this book and like so similar to what a lot of the people I interviewed for the book went through and, you know, clients and members of my audience have gone through and in some ways to what I went through as well in my journey with chronic illness and disordered eating. So really excited to kind of connect those dots. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, well, I kind of wrote down uh, some questions. We talked a little bit about, you know, what we were going to chat about. And I think just opening up 
um, you know, for people who might not know, you wrote um, and the book Anti Diet, your first book in 2019 was it mm-hmm. came, out came out in 2019. Late 2019, yeah, yeah, and um, it really you know goes into great detail about the harms and misinformation of diet culture and the industry at large. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, from there, what, what brought you into writing further, further about the wellness trap, there's a lot of overlapping things, but Mm -hmm. it, it goes off into its own corners as well, um, for the wellness trap. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, how your journey went from book one to book two? Yeah, absolutely. It was an interesting journey because I published Anti-Diet, you know, in December of 2019. So it was like three or four months before the world completely changed, before COVID upended everything. And I think really changed a lot of the wellness space too. Um, And I was already, you know, that in that book, in Anti-Diet, the second chapter is about wellness culture as the new guise of diet culture, how diets are masquerading as being about health and wellness, how every diet now wants to say it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle change. And, you know, Weight Watchers rebranded itself to WW with a tagline wellness that works. And, you know, so there's all this stuff happening sort of leading up to the publication of that book that was like very much diets cloaking themselves in the guise of wellness. And I was seeing how problematic that was. But then, you know, with COVID, I feel like wellness culture took on its own very weird sort of new um, iterations. And, you know, not only was it the new guise of diet culture, and there's such a such an intertwining of diet culture beliefs and values, especially of, you know, lionizing certain foods, demonizing others, right, this like good bad food rhetoric and, and dichotomy about foods, but also about body sizes and Um, you know, demonizing larger bodies and and holding up smaller bodies as the picture of health and wellness. But also, you know, with COVID, I think we've seen such a spread, you know, and, and the internet and social media and sort of the role that that's played. There's been such a proliferation of misinformation and disinformation and malinformation, which, you know, we can talk a little bit about what those terms mean. But basically, you know, bogus wellness content has really proliferated in the COVID years. And, you know, I had been kind of a part of like the crunchy, eco-friendly world for a long time prior to writing anti-diet, prior to sort of my second career as a dietitian or, you know, additional career as a dietitian because I was always a journalist. But I started my career in environmental journalism and, you know, writing about like food, nutrition and health specifically for a lot of environmental magazines and focusing on sustainability and food politics and things like that. And so I was, you know, in contact with and in a world with a lot of people who were Um, very crunchy, you know, some of whom were like skeptical of vaccines or did a lot of, um, you know, naturopathic elimination diet type of things. And, you know, we're really into alternative medicine. And I grew up around a lot of people like that, too, actually, like I grew up in the Bay Area in California, and we had family friends who were super into that stuff. And so um, I've seen firsthand sort of the effect that that can have. And I got really into that myself and sort of fell down a wellness rabbit hole with that. Um, you know, with like alternative medicine and um, diets and elimination diets, especially to try to address my chronic health conditions. And so, you know, I've seen how um, that can, how that can go and how that can lead people astray. But then in COVID, I think, you know, it was just this explosion of misinformation and, you know, false claims about things that could supposedly cure COVID. I was seeing a lot of like multi-level marketing companies, you know, that sell essential oils, like distributors, you know, posting on their social media saying this is, you know, use such and such an oil to cure COVID or take this supplement um, to boost your immune system and ward off the virus and things like that. And so there's all these false false promises and, you know, the sort of um, jumping on, like, like, I think a lot of the wellness industry really seized on the moment of COVID to try to um, capitalize to try to make money, right. And then, you know, there's this proliferation of, like, anti-vaccine content and misinformation and, you know, just sort of the um, weird pipeline that emerged of, like, 
uh, wellness to anti-vax to QAnon and sort of like wild right-wing conspiracy theories that were getting intertwined with the wellness space. And so it was just really a fascinating moment, I think, in time to sort of witness. And I was already thinking about writing a book about wellness, but I didn't really know what the focus would be exactly. And with that, you know, with the emergence of all that and COVID, I really thought, okay, like this is, there's really something here, you know, not just the connection between wellness culture and diet culture, but like the, you know, I really wanted to pull that thread around misinformation and conspiracy theories and, you know, how social media proliferates, you know, and, and um, spreads mis and disinformation. And also like the, the dubious diagnoses chapter, which, uh, you know, for various reasons, the way the book is organized, I had to sort of like, recut a lot of things and shuffle around chapters and so it ended up that the chapter on dubious diagnoses and spurious cures is chapter eight or chapter six um but what i really wanted was you know for that to be a little bit sooner and like more central because to me that was also a huge part of why i wrote this book was like that i was seeing so many people being misdiagnosed and given these labels that you know not only were they recommended like extreme diets and supplement regimens and, you know, things that don't have a lot of great evidence behind them as supposed cures. But when I started to dig into like these diagnoses and these labels that people were getting, because a lot of people would come to me saying, you know, my naturopath told me I have chronic candida and I need to cut out all these foods or my, um, you know, functional medicine doctor told me I have adrenal fatigue and I have to do such and such protocol for that. Or, you know, this questionnaire online told me I have you know, whatever. And so, you know, seeing a lot of people coming to me with questions about that, like, how do I, you know, do what I need to do to take care of my health and cut out all these foods that, you know, alternative medicine person is telling me I need to do while also, you know, healing my relationship with food or not triggering myself with disordered eating. And, you know, to me, that question, when I initially started getting that kind of question years ago, I was like, dutifully going into PubMed and being like, okay, what are, you know, what's the evidence really say about these things? And like, again, and again, I was finding that, you know, the actual label that people were getting, um, labels that people were getting were, were false and inaccurate, you know, that's that there's actually no such thing as adrenal fatigue, even though people can have all kinds of symptoms that are labeled as such, and the symptoms are very real. And, you know, they may have any number of real chronic conditions that actually need and deserve care. But it isn't this you know, this label of so-called adrenal fatigue or same with, you know, chronic, quote unquote, chronic candida, um, you know, people can have candida overgrowth that, you know, in various sort of acute ways, but there's no such thing actually as chronic candida that's like systemic and causes all these sort of nebulous symptoms that a people, people are being told it causes. And, you know, they don't mm -hmm. need to cut out yeast and gluten and all these things from their diet to, to cure this supposed condition. So, um, you know, I think that was a really interesting part of the book as well was to look at like the proliferation of that type of thinking. And I think in the the years since I've published, since since Anti-Diet was published, that has also exploded, you know, that kind of like um, integrative and functional medicine approach to things and some of these dubious labels getting more traction and, you know, more currency. And um, I look at like podcast charts more than more often than I should having two podcasts of my own. I, you know, it's not great for my mental health to do that, but I do sometimes check out the uh, health and wellness podcast charts. And I see that, you know, consistently at the top of the charts are, you know, podcasts by people who adhere to these um, alternative medicine philosophies that really don't have good scientific evidence behind them. And, you know, so I started thinking about like why people are drawn to these things. Why was I drawn to those things back in the day, you know, and um, yeah. really, understanding the reasons why like people feel so underserved by the conventional healthcare system, why they feel the need to, to, you know, search for answers in alternative spaces and what are they getting from those spaces that they aren't getting and they should be getting in, in conventional healthcare. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There are like so many things. Um, like my brain's like this, 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 there's like all these things, but one of the things that really struck me reading the book is is about I mean it made sense it just I had never it had never been put that way seeing like how much information people are essentially getting from social media influencers you know with with no credentials and you know they've created protocols and and um and it was just really fascinating to see 
that you shed light on all of these trends that I was seeing, you know, but you're kind of calling them out as like, you know, this is like our old model of snake oil salesman, which you talk a bit about in the book. Um, we kind of have that where there's, you know, and, and it's tricky, right? Because a few things like, you know, things that you call out there is that, you know, a lot of this is in response to the struggles we have with the conventional medicine system, you know, not properly serving people with chronic conditions, chronic illnesses. Um, and so, yeah, gosh, it's, it's such a hard, um, nuanced kind of conversation to have because the word wellness feels so benign, right? Um, it, I think, you know, for a lot of people, it's going to be, that's going to be the first eye opener of like, well, what's, you know, what's wrong with this idea? Um, and I think maybe, I don't know if this is, you know, you can take this in whatever direction you want, but I think for us to like, understand healthism and how wellness culture really um, makes everyone feel as though we should be in complete control of our health. Um, if we have chronic conditions, we should be able to heal them and cure them. And, and then you have, you know, this whole wellness influencer, in, in, influencer industry who's giving us you know all of these things to try from diets to supplements um and so you know you just have this kind of vast uh, industry of of where do we where do we even turn for good information <laughs> where do we get um who can we trust you know yeah yeah, I think, yeah, there's so much there too, like to, to unpack and explore. And I think, you know, a lot of people think of wellness as the antonym for illness, which it is, right, in some sense, in the sort of the basic first definitionary, de de dictionary definition sense, you know, it's like the antonym for illness. And that's how the term has been used since like the 1600s or something. But, you know, and I think for people with chronic illness and who are used to not feeling good, it's like wellness feels like what they're you know, what the goal is. It's like just feeling well as opposed to feeling ill. Um, but in the 1970s or so, the the term wellness started to take on the connotation that it has today. And it um, started to be used in this way to sort of um, indicate like an opt a, a constant striving for optimization, you know, the sense that we should always be um, working towards achieving some sort of level of peak wellness that actually is never totally attainable and is always kind of receding in the distance. There's always more we could be doing to, you know, quote unquote, optimize our wellness and um, be even healthier than, you know, we thought we could be or whatever. And um, so I think that that definition of wellness is very um, dangerous for a lot of people because it, you know, puts people on this hamster wheel of always feeling like they need to be striving for something better and better and better. And I think, I think especially for people with chronic illness and chronic conditions where, you know, they have something that, that sort of ebbs and flows, but is there all the time, you know, conditions that, that aren't going to go away and be quote unquote healed. Um, you know, the sense of achieving peak or optimal wellness feels very out of reach. And yet there's this huge promise made by wellness culture purveyors that says you can you can heal this through food. You can heal this with the right lifestyle choices. You can, you know, heal this quote unquote naturally. You don't have to live with these symptoms ebbing and flowing for the rest of your life. You don't have to, um, you know, you can put your diseases into remission, right? And that that notion of remission and that notion of like, you know, healing it forever um, and not having to live with conditions that, you know, might detract from our quality of life and, and you know, cause illness at various points is very appealing and I think very seductive to people who have chronic conditions. And then, you know, this pursuit of wellness and this pursuit of optimization, um, I've really seen 
create a lot of symptoms and a lot of problems and you know illness in and of itself right like it, it can cause a lot of the same symptoms it purports to solve it can exacerbate symptoms that already exist it can cause new ones to pop up because you know people are restricting their eating they're you know ending up with a lot of digestive disorders and conditions that you know are are really triggered and exacerbated by um, intense elimination diets by you know, loading up on fruits and vegetables by taking really heavy duty, extreme kind of supplement protocols. And, um, you know, that like people who are coming in for healing, even if it's like ostensibly supposed to be something that heals digestive issues, um, you know, wellness protocols can actually make that stuff worse, right? They can also worsen fatigue and, you know, sort of like headaches and these like like nebulous conditions that are symptoms that that are really hard to pin down and that people are searching for answers for right and like you know you have fatigue and brain fog and you're looking to like feel better and feel more alert and you know not as exhausted all the time and some of the things that you're being um, told to do can actually worsen that right can you know deplete your energy, make you feel really, you know, extra fatigued because you're not eating enough because you're um, in this, you know, restrict cycle or maybe even restrict binge or restrict rebound cycle with food. Um, you know, some of the the protocols, you know, we talked about this for uh, the episode we're doing on my podcast, how, you know, some of the protocols um, you went through and I know a lot of people have gone through, it's, it's like, you're going to feel worse before you get, you feel better. You know, that's the yeah. line, right? That's how it's yeah. framed. It's like, this is going to make you feel worse before you feel better, but it's because your body's detoxing or because your body's having this, you know, Herxheimer reaction of like the, the toxins dying off or whatever it is. And, you know, that's a really um, convenient way, I think, to sort of explain away some of the symptoms that are actually caused by the protocols themselves and some of the ways that our bodies like react to them and fight against them. You know, it's like, oh, well, this is your body detoxing. So you just need to do it longer and harder and like keep going right. because it means Double it's down. working. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. So yeah. yeah, I see I see that, you know, having such detrimental effects on people and, you know, with social media and the way that um, social media algorithms amplify the most extreme, the most novel and controversial information, because that's what yes. keeps people on the platforms. That's what keeps people engaged, right? And the platforms are designed to maximize engagement so that they can, you know, so it makes that's that's literally the business model is how the social media companies make their money. Um, and so more and more extreme wellness practices really get traction and currency on those platforms and there's no you know monitoring or moderating in a lot of cases and even things that are ostensibly supposed to be moderated away you know slip through the cracks because it's ai and it doesn't catch everything and so you have this you know proliferation of just really out there bogus wellness content that is not helpful and you know leads people often into very extreme places like anti-vaccine rhetoric or you know conspiracy theories and things like that as well. Um, and I think, you yeah. know, at the, at the root of that is like people's desire to feel better and mistrust of conventional medicine and of institutions in general. And totally. there is a real, you know, validity to some of that, right? Like conventional healthcare has failed a lot of people. A lot of people have felt dismissed or unheard or un unserved or underserved by it. A lot of people have reason to mistrust and distrust institutions, you know, that that have failed us in times like COVID, but also, you know, pharmaceutical industry has definitely had some, you know, serious problems and, um, you know, regulation has not always been, um, you know, looking out for people's interests and stuff like that. So there's there's real criticism to be made of those kinds of institutions. And I think what we see in wellness culture often is, you know, bad actors or just um, people trying to capitalize will sort of take those grains of truth. Like, yeah, the pharmaceutical industry is problematic or yeah, like conventional healthcare hasn't made you feel served and sort of twist that into saying, only I have the solution, only this wellness practice that's, you know, alternative and outside of the con conventional system can help you. Um, doctors don't want you to know, you know, there's a lot of this like conspiratorial language that you might see. Um, you know, that th this idea that like doctors are keeping a secret from you and they want to um, 
like for some reason are withholding helpful treatment and, you know, are withholding this magical secret that like you can cure your diseases through food and that, you know, you don't need, because again, it goes back to this idea of big pharma, right? That it's out for profits and it's, you know, trying to keep people sick in order to keep profiting. And, you know, again, there's this grain of truth of like the pharmaceutical industry is shady in some ways. And, and yet, you know, all of these grand conspiracy theories that are peddled in the name of wellness and, you know, sometimes the, the anti-vaccine movement as well, um, you know, those don't actually have validity either. But I think it's really hard to distinguish that, especially when you're desperate for healing and help. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, you know, I think something that that I'm curious about, it's like, how do you how do you navigate when you're working with somebody who um who, who really believes that certain wellness um, protocols, like just for example, let's say giving up gluten, you know, like I tried giving up gluten a lot of times and I think I feel a little lucky that I never felt better. I never had that initial, you know, um, uh, period of having relief, but I think, but I also know people who do have that and you know in your experience how do you how do you sort of um, guide people off of that kind of um, fixing it with food and and really thinking um, it, it is just this one thing and the magic bullet is to give up xyz food you know how do you how do you work with them and navigate that what advice do you give yeah, I think it's it's different for different people, of course, and, you know, different people might have different degrees of sort of like skepticism already, you're questioning whether something is working. So I'll often ask people like, how do you feel this is working for you? Do you, you know, was there, because this is often the case, and this happened for me a lot too, where there was this like, um, placebo honeymoon phase at the beginning, right? Where you feel, you know, many people will feel better when they're trying something new just because they feel a sense of hope and they feel like someone is taking care of them and like someone has answers for them and whoever gave them this gluten-free diet or whatever the protocol is, you know, is going to get to the bottom of it and is going to look out for them and help, help them figure out what's going on and it's going to like solve their problem. And so, um, you know, that's a very real thing and like there's there's real effects to that right the mind body connection is strong there's a something called the care effect which is you know feeling heard and understood and empathized with by a care provider there's you know the sort of classic placebo effect that people know about which is like believing that something that is actually inert is you know believing that it's helping you making you feel better um, even though it, it doesn't have any effect um, and then there's the nocebo effect which is like believing something is bad and is hurting you and therefore it actually kind of does cause symptoms and i think a lot of that is at play in wellness culture um, spaces right that you know you might have this sort of initial placebo and nocebo effect and um, the care effect and there's also just the sort of what's called the uh, natural history of disease where you know autoimmune conditions and other chronic conditions have an ebb and flow where they'll sort of naturally flare up and then kind of get back to baseline and then flare up and then you know a little little better and so um, if you happen to try a protocol at the height of one of the ebbs or or the flows, I guess, of, of uh, the disease, right? At the height of, you know, of symptoms. And oftentimes people will try something new when symptoms are, are at a peak, right? Because they're so desperate for healing and it's, it feels bad. Um, and then, you know, even if the, na the, the natural flow of disease or, you know, ebb of the disease takes them back into a place where they, they would feel better anyway, um, oftentimes we're tempted to to give credit to the thing that we tried when we were at our peak, right? So it's like, well, I tried this new gluten-free diet or I tried these new supplements or I did this protocol that was recommended by this provider and I feel better. So let me credit, you know, I'm crediting that. Um, and I think the problem is that, that the, you know, chronic illness does tend to ebb and flow again and again and the placebo effect often kind of wears off after a certain point and so people might continue on a certain protocol and then find well actually i think my symptoms are returning and often what the recommendation is in a lot of these wellness spaces and alternative space you know alternative medicine spaces is like um, do it harder do it more right add more restrictions yeah. add more 
you know, yeah. protocol, like cut making, out more things, cut out more things, do these yep. additional, you know, practices, you know, add supplements, yep. whatever. And yeah. um, that just takes people, you know, further and further down this rabbit hole and also makes them feel like, you know, it's their fault that they're not doing enough things to, to stem the, the flow of the disease symptoms, you know? Yeah. And I think there was, you know, something you touched on a little bit earlier that in my experience is also at play here, which is that like, you know, oftentimes it's the dieting behavior that is exacerbating like an overall kind of imbalance with, with certain foods, you know, and Mm -hmm. I guess in my experience, um, you know, as you know, I tried probably a dozen diets, different special diets to try to cure, you know, my chronic illness problems. And they always seem to be the foods, you know, that, that we love, or like, you know, Mm -hmm. the things like gluten or dairy or sugar. Um, And those are foods that can also you can have an kind of imbalanced restrict relationship with because of diet culture. And I think one thing that was really interesting in my experience of, you know, like training myself out of that restriction cycle was, you know, chronic illness is so sensitive just to, I think, too much or too little of a lot of things, Mm. you know, it can just be like a, um, a a sort of trigger. And so I've noticed like it, I always blamed things on sugar. Oh, sugar is giving me headaches and migraines. Um, But then once, you know, once I was able to really balance out that relationship with sugar, I realized like, oh, it's not just sugar. It's that, you know, there are so many foods that I can feel sensitive. You know, I, at 1.8, like a lot of salad. And I kind of felt sick after I ate the salad. And I was like, (laughs) you know, there's, I I just felt like, wow, I feel the things that I felt, you know, from what I thought were the foods that were, had been demonized, you know, in our culture, obviously sugar being another one of the big ones right now. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, that I think, chronic illness, there's just, it's a lot more sensitive to whatever's not feeling balanced in our bodies um, and needing rest and needing nourishment and food and, you know, the things that make you feel better. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So I I feel like that kind of eating, like going too long without eating. That was so huge for me. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, And I think another thing, you know, thinking about in, in play with all of this is, you know, it's not like you, you do a great job of shedding light on a lot of these fringe spaces. Um, You know, I had, I didn't know about the algorithm targeting like new moms, Mm. specifically, you know, that was a really kind of um, a, a hard chapter to to read and know like how um, new parents and new moms you know already have so much anxiety and I wonder if you could just touch on that really briefly um, going back to the kind of the social media inflaming all yeah. of this misinformation that we're getting about health and wellness. Totally yeah I think you know the one of the biggest problems with social media is that these companies are based on a system called surveillance advertising, which is like they, you know, build dossiers on us of what we like, our demographics, our psychographics, you know, what we're interested in and sort of what our pain points are at a certain time so that they can advertise to us and like specifically target us right where we are and like have, you know, ads that have the most, the greatest chance of getting um, clicked and stuff. And, you know, one of the the side effects, I think, of the surveillance advertising is not just that, you know, things will creepily follow us around the internet that we're like, oh, I really want this skin serum or whatever it is, um, you know, and, and I, it won't stop following me, so I have to buy it. But also that, you know, we get put into these funnels and into the path of 
wellness misinformation that can be increasingly extreme. And, you know, when new parents are searching for information about like taking care of their kids or the health and wellness of their kids, um, algorithms can start delivering them, you know, increasingly extreme wellness content. And now this is not supposed to be happening anymore, but of course it still is. There's still reports of this happening because again, like AI moderation can't catch everything. And the anti-vaccine movement is a shape-shifting, you know, sort of looking for ways to evade AI moderation. So when new parents are, you know, get into that sort of funnel of getting more and more extreme information um, sent to them, one of the things they can often get is recommendations for groups that are anti-vaccine or that are, um, you know, quote unquote, vaccine skeptical, but actually radicalize people and make them, you know, fear the vaccine and um, not vaccinate their kids. And, you know, this has been a problem for years. You know, it started to, I mean, going back to like 2008 with um, Andrew Wakefield publishing his discredited, now discredited study. Um, but you know it's it's been happening for much longer um no 1998 sorry i'm like adding 10 years um but you know the, the with the advent of social media there's um you know the new ways that people have started to be really targeted and um you know i'm so grateful that for me when i was a new mom i and you know still i'm a relatively new mom but i i have been largely off social media for my own mental health and because of a lot of this reporting that i did showing you know the real pitfalls and dangers of spending too much time on social media and feeling like yeah that resonates with my experience you know with how it affected my mental health to yeah. be on there so much yeah um and yet i still feel like you know there's these little ways that it it catches me you know i'm on some email list that is you know taking me to things that are like increasingly wellnessy and you know when, when you're sleep deprived and looking for ways to, you know, help with diaper rash or help your baby's stomach settle or whatever it is, you know, there's, you're going to be vulnerable to trying things that are not super evidence-based and not, not proven. And when social media, you know, when you start to click things, when you start to like things or explore things and show interest in things on social media, you know, the algorithm recognizes that and says, okay, this person is spending time on content like this. Let's show them more like this, but even more radical, you know, it's not, it's not like mm -hmm. sentient, obviously it's not making that decision, um, deliberately, but it's, you know, it, it's programmed to to give people kind of more of the same, but take them a little bit further and, and radicalize them a little bit more because that slightly more controversial version of what whatever they're already looking at is what's going to keep them on the platform. Um, right. So yeah, it's, right. it's so super tricky. problematic. And, and that yeah. is, you know, that that is one of the ways that a lot of people get into the anti-vax community and pipeline is through, you know, being a new parent and searching for information. Um, another way is, is with COVID, you know, because there's been so much vaccine misinformation during COVID as well. And so that's been kind of an emerging right. Um, right. fear into anti-vaccine stuff. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, also I think about tr just trends in general that crop up and, and how even sources that feel like they should be more reputable um, pick up on those a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think through your work that was that's been it's something that's been helpful to learn is just um, you know even journalism that that we trust or news sources that we trust they're they're going to pick up stories on um, trendy things like I think about intermittent fasting. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that trend just mm. really briefly. <laughs> and how yeah. I feel like I feel like I didn't see very much critical uh, coverage of it. It was just all like, oh, this new thing, like get on board, this new thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. There was so little critical coverage, I think, outside of the anti diet community, anyway. But like, you know, with sort of mainstream publications, definitely, I saw a lot of, you know, praise on intermittent fasting and sort of framing it as a way to, you know, hack your body into health and, you know, all of these pseudo, you know, supposedly scientific sounding terms being thrown around as to why 
intermittent fasting is supposedly good. And then, you know, for years, I feel like that was happening. And then, you know, a study was released showing that intermittent fasters, you know, a randomized controlled trial, the gold standard of, of scientific evidence, um, showed that intermittent fasters didn't have any benefit, you know, to, to health or any significantly, um, you know, any greater weight loss than people who were doing just kind of a standard diet, um, a standard like calorie restricted diet. And, you know, both groups initially lost weight and then regained weight over the course of the intervention um, or of the, of the course of the follow-up period. Both groups initially, you know, had some improvement in certain biomarkers that reverted at the end of the follow-up period. Um, and fasters, intermittent fasters, ended up losing more muscle mass than people on this calorie-restricted diet. And I found it so interesting mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the lead author of that study had said that he was an intermittent faster before he, like, he himself had been intermittent fasting for seven years before undertaking that study. And when he saw the results, he said, you know, I stopped, like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Oh, wow. Um, oh. You know, and, he, <laughs> and you know, it, that is also such an interesting story like thinking about you know scientists have their own little pet things and like diets that they do and trends that they get involved in and you know end up wanting to study for personal reasons and um i think it's actually somewhat rare for someone i mean i don't know not necessarily rare but i do see unfortunately some scientists who are wedded to something for personal reasons double down sometimes um but mm. in this case it was kind of a refreshing you know situation where he was like <laughs> I stopped. I don't, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to promote it anymore, you know? Um, and yeah. I think that was kind of the first, like that, the reporting on that study was the first like mainstream serious critique that I saw of intermittent fasting. You know, there were some stories here and there that's, that talked to like eating disorder experts and said, you know, people with disordered eating or at risk of it shouldn't do this. And, you know, it can be triggering, but also here are all these health benefits, you know, it was like sort of right, sandwiched right. in all of this like hype. And, um, you know, it turns right. out it really is not effective um, for the things that, you know, it's pur purported to be. Right. And, and it in, in itself is, is it, it's a diet, it's mm -hmm. disordered eating, you know, so it's, turning people on to, you know, that as a, it's, it's a lifestyle change is how it's sold. But, uh, you know, again, we're just back into diet culture, diet behavior. Fasting um, is a disordered eating behavior. Yeah. It's like one of the right, exactly. best known disordered eating behaviors, you know? Right. Right. Um, yeah. What, you know, when you think about, um, what you would recommend for people maybe who who feel like they're they're really in wellness trends maybe they'd like you know think they'd like to you know learn how to release themselves from a lot of these or you know maybe they're not don't even feel like they are ready mm -hmm. um what would you say for folks um who are kind of wrapped up in a lot of this and um, you know, how to, how to move forward, how to think about it critically. Yeah. I mean, first I would offer a lot of compassion for people who are wrapped up in it, you know, and, um, like if you're feeling like something is working for you and you're in that, you know, possibly placebo effect of the early stages, like I'm not trying to take that away. I think, you know, there's a benefit to the placebo effect actually, like, um, you know, we can, feel better when we feel like something is giving us hope and if it's not you know if you don't feel like it's detracting too much from your life at this point or you're not um you know it feels like the the risks are not outweighing the benefits then you know everybody has to kind of do that calculus for themselves but what i would say is tr a try to keep an open mind and consider that you know the risks are potentially accruing and you know the the detriment and the harm to your well-being might not show up right away when you're in that sort of initial hopeful phase but down the line you might start to see oh, okay actually this is really having a negative impact on my relationship with food on my relationships with other people on my bank account or, you know it's not effective right um, you might start to see all of these you know cracks in the armor um, and I think the biggest thing too is for people in that space, whether you're starting to see 
problems and starting to question it or whether you're totally on board, um, you know, especially I think if you're totally, totally on board and feeling like something is really working, is just to try to resist the urge to proselytize about it, you know, try to not mm -hmm. go out there and say, like, this worked for me, and this is the thing and everybody should try this or, you know, even publicly posting about your journey and like, speaking in glowing terms about something, even if you're not explicitly saying everybody should try this, I think there's this implicit message that, you know, for people who are struggling with similar things or want to avoid what you're going through, that they should do what you're doing. And, um, you know, I think just trying to keep in mind that you never know who's in your audience, you never know who's going to be vulnerable to um, the harms of these wellness practices. And so even if you yourself have not experienced the harms personally yet, there are probably people around you, people in your friends and family and your social networks who are vulnerable, who might, you know, experience disordered eating and, you know, a lot of symptoms and side effects of the of the things that you're doing. And so, you know, to not put them in the path of that kind of misinformation um, or yeah. that kind of harm, you know, and to, yeah. to just hold it lightly, right? Try to hold lightly anything that feels like it's working for you, which I know is so hard to do when you're desperate for healing and you want this to be the thing, you know, you're like, yes. oh, I just, just want to know that this is the thing that's going to help me feel better. And yes. I think it's, it's just a, you know, a practice of like letting go and trying to just say, well, maybe this is working. I'm trying it. Who knows? And, and also being realistic with yourself about what the evidence really says, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, integrative and functional medicine, especially like in the functional medicine space, I see a lot of things that are like framed as cutting edge science or the latest research mm. or, you know, this stuff that's like supposedly so ahead of the rest of scientific, um, you know, the rest of the like the healthcare system and stuff. But actually, oftentimes, that kind of science is really early stage and limited. And, you know, it's not, it's not ready for prime time, really, like it's, you know, evidence in animals or in cell cultures or in um, computer models or in very small groups of people who are very different from, you know, the sort of average population and so might have different outcomes because of that, you know, so like really seeing what the evidence actually says and not getting caught up in all the hype about something and all the scientific sounding language. Um, and research actually shows that people who have a broad trust in science and are sort of like, yeah, I believe science are more likely to be duped by things that have um, scientific sounding language, maybe scientific mm. references, but they're not like oh, checking the references, tricky. you know, right? So yeah. becoming a critical consumer of science, I think, is the way to avoid that um, pitfall, you know, starting to think yeah. about science as like an iterative process and not this like perfect thing that, oh, if it's science, it means it's correct, you know, but to, to right. start to look at the strengths and limitations of studies and of, of the science behind any given practice. Yeah, and you do give some some good tools in the book for how to how to read content and hear content critically and take a critical lens and um some steps so that's that's a nice tool to have you know because there's a lot of Thanks. a lot of feelings of like where do we turn um yeah. and i think the other thing just sort of to wrap up here um that i would mention is that you know you're you're really shining a light on a lot of things that can you know, feel through the book, you go through this journey of like overwhelmment and like, oh my gosh, you know, this and that. And, and I think, you know, we get to your chapter eight, um, which is just this like lovely um, piece of hope. And, you know, you're talking in that about the contrast of wellness wellness versus well-being and so I wonder if you could just say a little bit about you know how how you bring in this broader view of what we're really after is well-being here and there's there's so much more to take in than these individual personal um lifestyle choices you know yeah, totally. Yeah, because wellness culture and wellness sort of emphasizes the individual and like these 
supposed self-optimization practices that people are always supposed to be doing and striving for, I think it can make people feel very guilty and very ashamed of not being able to attain that, you know, mythical ideal of wellness and feel personally responsible for their illness and feel like they're failures. And, you know, all of that can really negatively impact people's mental health. And that's to say nothing of like the disordered eating that is sort of perpetuated by wellness culture and how that can impact people's mental well-being and physical well-being as well, right? There's so many aspects of wellness culture that, that I think make people feel less than, you know, people feel like their failures, they're wrong, they're bad for not being well, and, you know, that they need to just figure it out and bootstrap themselves into health, right? And all of that is just so detrimental, I think, to overall well-being, you know, which I define as, and I mean, people define, you know, as the sort of definition is like, it's a, it's a more global sense of um, well-being that encompasses, you know, not just the physical, not just physical health, but also mental well-being, social connectedness, um, you know, economic security, um, you know, emotional health, like all of these aspects of our lives that are really important for some people. Spirituality is part of that too, right? Feeling, um, you know, connected in all these different ways. And that that is really I think what's what's important and often what people are searching for when they're searching for wellness, you know, like the concept of wellness and this idea of self-optimization often stands in for some of these other things, like for social connection and purpose and having a sense of, you know, value and like a sense that you're, you know, a valued person that is doing the right thing or whatever. Um, and so I think if we can just drop that pursuit of wellness and start yeah, to focus stress. on the stress that that really puts on us yeah and that and that sort of individual sense of responsibility and failure when we're not able to live up to the ideals and instead start to think about like how can we support our well-being and that includes collective well-being too you know i talk a lot in the book about how this is not just an individual pursuit and there are a lot of like systemic and policy changes that need to be made in the name of promoting well-being um and so you know thinking about your mental and emotional and social and economic and you know perhaps spiritual health in addition to your your physical health um and not beating yourself up for you know chronic illness or symptoms that you might be experiencing, but sort of trying to, you know, to the extent possible, and I know this is hard, but like trying to hold those things with compassion and be really compassionate and gentle with yourself when you're going through that and to, to have a sense of maybe acceptance, which I know is, is scary for some people because, you know, getting to a place of acceptance can sometimes mean you feel like you're not going to find the cure or the the way of like getting this to remit that you really want, you know? Um, yeah. But I think it can be an ebb and flow, right? It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be like one thing forever, you know, you've accepted it and you're done. It's like, there's probably going to be a grieving process that goes in and out of like, oh, I just wish I could do these things that other people do and I can't. And it's yeah. so frustrating. You know, I go through that totally. a lot myself too. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm doing same. a lot of virtual events because I can't travel and do a lot in person and especially with COVID and chronic illness stuff like you know being in person is a risk for me and like that's super frustrating you know but um and you know I try to like embrace the fact that I am taking a path that's right for me that is really supporting my well-being and um you know not beat myself up for not being able to do these things that quote unquote everybody else supposedly is able to do yeah knowing the space that you need yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. I see John popped in. <laughs> Sorry, I was mm -hmm. trying to un trying to unmute myself there, and it, it's taking a second. Um, I, I we can hear you. Yes. I I I want to be able to let you talk a, a, another hour. Um, I, I have a bunch <laughs> of questions too, and that's 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 so fascinating to think about. Um, a lot of things that 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 I've been thinking about as well, but but a lot of my questions you you anticipated it and and answered and and i feel like if i if i bring up the seed oils meme we could probably talk for another mm. uh, another <laughs> hour or two as well <laughs> okay. um but I, I want to leave you to your evening so i think that's a, a wonderful note to to to, to end on and uh, christy harrison eliza wheeler thank you so much for joining us
at, at Homo Fluterati. You can buy the wellness trap, uh, break free from diet culture, disinformation, and dubious diagnoses, and find your true well-being. There's a link in the chat. There's also a link in the description below if you're watching on YouTube from us at Literati Bookstore or whatever independent bookstore you prefer to purchase from. Um, hope to have you both back on at Homo Fluterati at some point in the not-too-distant future for, for either of your next books. Uh, but until then, uh, I hope you continue to stay well uh, and and out of the air if it's uh, yeah. still smoky in your neck of the woods. Um, and to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. And take care all. Have a great night. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.